All right, now let's discuss the monopoly model or the, the model of monopoly pricing. Remember with the perfectly competitive market, we had to split it between two views. We had the market view and the firm view, and we had to go back and forth to see what was happening at both sides. But when there's a monopoly, it's the only firm in the market, so the market view is the only one we need to worry about, okay? Uh, so we've the, the monopolist is facing a downward sloping demand curve. That's the market demand curve. Remember, the perfectly competitive firm had to just take the market price and use that as its demand curve. But the monopolist can raise its price and it'll lose some customers, but it's going to still be able to make some sales. It can cut its price and get more customers, okay? And so the monopolist is having to decide what price do I want to set in order to maximize my profits. Now, let's talk about, remember in the last lecture on perfectly competitive markets, we talked about marginal cost and marginal revenue. In order to make sense of the monopolist choice, we need to add those to this graph. Now, for marginal cost, we're going to make a simplifying assumption for the monopolist, and that is that he's got, uh, what would you say, constant marginal cost. So it's not going to be a U-shaped curve. It's not going to be a, a curve that starts at zero and then increases. For simplicity, we're going to model the monopolist as having a, a marginal cost curve that's just a straight line. Okay, every unit costs exactly the same amount as every other unit. Notice, by the way, if that's the case, this marginal cost curve would also be the average variable cost curve of the firm because every single unit is selling at the same price. So the average is just going to be that same price throughout. Okay, so we've got marginal cost. Now, it turns out that the monopolist is also going to want to set marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. Uh, when it produces its optimal level of output, its profit maximizing level of output. But in order to figure out where that might be, I need to take you through, um, through some logic and reasoning uh, with regards to the quantity that the firm could produce, the price at which they could sell that quantity of units, uh, the total revenue they would earn at that level of output, and what their marginal revenue is. So let's go through that. Uh, I'm going to just mark in the following levels of output. One unit, two, three, four, and five. Okay. Now here's what I'm not going to worry about what happens if you're selling zero units. That's as long as you set the price above, at or above the y-intercept of this demand curve. Okay. But if you sell one unit, let's just say that that first unit, the highest price you could sell it for, would be $10. Now, if you wanted to sell the second unit, you would have to cut your price from 10 to nine. To sell a third unit, you'd have to cut the price again from nine to eight. To sell the fourth unit, you'd have to cut the price again now to $7. And we'll say, if you cut the price to $6, you could sell five units. Okay. Now also keep in mind, we're assuming that the monopolist is charging a single price so they can't sell the first one for $10 and then sell the second one for $9 and then sell the third one for $8. If they want to sell three units, they have to sell all three of them at a price of $8. If they want to sell five units, they have to sell all five of them at a price of $6. Okay. So what is their total revenue going to be? Well, it's just going to be the quantity of units they sell times the price. So we just multiply the numbers in these two columns. Total revenue would be $10 if they sell one unit. If they sell two units, two times nine is 18. Three times eight is 24. Four times seven is 28. Five times six is 30. And what is marginal revenue? Marginal revenue is how much extra revenue are you getting by selling that additional unit? Total unit uh, revenue would obviously be zero if you're not selling any units. So on the first unit that you sell, your marginal revenue is going to be those 10 extra dollars that you would get. Now, if you set your price at $9 and sell two units, your total revenue is going from 10 to 18. So your marginal revenue is $8 on the first unit. If you sell a third unit, 
your total revenue would go from 18 to 24. And so your marginal revenue on that unit would be six. The difference between 24 and 28 is $4. So marginal revenue would be $4 on the fourth unit that you sell. And the difference between 28 and 30 is two, okay? Now, notice the relationship here. This quantity and price, these combinations, that's mapping out the demand curve, okay? What about the quantity and marginal revenue? Well, that is mapping out what the marginal revenue curve looks like. And notice a couple of things. First of all, the marginal revenue starts at the same level as the price, which tells you that our marginal revenue curve, it's gonna begin where the demand curve does at that same point. And now notice something else. The demand curve falls by $1 per unit, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. The marginal revenue curve falls at $2 per unit, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2. Now I could do a proof that, you know, I could use a little calculus and algebra to prove to you that as long as you have a, a straight downward sloping demand curve, uh, the marginal revenue curve is going to start at the same place as the demand curve and fall with twice the negative slope. It's twice as steep as the demand curve is. Could show that to you, don't want to take the time to, and not everybody's taking calculus yet, so it wouldn't do you all that, some of you, all that much good. Uh, but just take this specific example as proof enough that our marginal revenue curve we can find by starting at the same point as the demand curve starts, and then it's gonna fall to wherever the demand curve hits the, y the x axis, you go half that distance. That's gonna be where the marginal revenue curve hits the x axis. It's gonna look like that, okay? All right, so Got our marginal revenue curve, our marginal cost curve, and it turns out that, like I mentioned before, a monopolist is going to use the same rule to maximize profit as a firm in a perfectly competitive market. That is, set your output where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. It's just that for a monopolist, that has a different, um, a different implication for what you're going to do. So we find that point where this green curve intersects the, the red curve. That right there is the point where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. Now, if we drop this line down to the x-axis, that tells us QM, the quantity of units the monopolist would produce. And now the question is, what price would the monopolist charge? Well, the monopolist is gonna to wanna to charge the highest price that they possibly can for that level of output. And to find that highest price, we ignore the marginal cost curve, we ignore the marginal revenue curve. It's the demand curve that tells us the highest price we could sell those QM units for. So we take this, this point and we plug that quantity of units into the demand curve. Wherever it hits the demand curve, that's gonna tell you the price. So you get a price. PM. And remember what I said in the last video about uh, definitions. If you have market power, that means you can set your price above marginal cost and not lose all of your customers. And that's what's going on here. This, by the way, I'll get to the in the on the next sheet of paper. That difference between marginal cost and price, that's called the monopoly markup. Okay. Before we get to um, discussing the monop monopoly markup and how it interacts with elasticity, I want to show you now how the, uh, how you end up, what would you say, how the gains from trade are carved up. Now notice that all the available gains from trade is this large triangle here that's bounded above by the demand curve and below by the marginal cost curve. That tells you the difference between what it costs to produce a unit and what somebody values it at for every single unit that gets produced. So those are all the available gains from trade. How does that get carved up under Monopoly? Well, the firm is going to capture 
all of the surplus that is below the price that they charge and above the marginal cost of producing those units for the number of units that they produce. So it's gonna be this rectangle right here. Okay, call that the monopoly profit. Which is just a fancy way of saying the producer surplus. Okay, the firm is earning economic profits here. Customers are not left out completely in the in the cold. They also get some uh, some gains from trade, some surplus. It's going to be the difference between the price that the monopolist charges them and the highest price they would have been w willing to pay, which is defined by this demand curve. So you ignore the marginal revenue curve for everything except figuring out the level of output. Okay, when you're figuring out their consumer surplus, you go right past that marginal revenue curve and you just look at the triangle bounded by the demand curve and the monopolist price. That's the consumer surplus. Okay. Notice, however, that there's this whole area to the right that the consumer doesn't get and the monopolist doesn't get either. And that is our old friend or rather our old enemy the deadweight loss. There's this level of output where uh, from the QM, from the level of output that the monopolist would produce, all the way to the point where marginal cost hits the demand curve, on all of those units, the uh, buyers would be willing to pay more than what it costs the seller to produce those units. But as we'll see in another slide, you know, another uh, sheet of paper, the, the monopolist is not going to want to produce that many units because that would push their price down so low they're not going to make any uh, economic profits. This price and this quantity maximizes the area that the monopolist can capture. So that's where they want to stay. So a couple of things. Note that because there's at least one barrier to entry, New firms can't come in and compete with the monopolist and push that price down. And second, this deadweight loss, this is the economic cost of monopoly. Just like a deadweight loss is the economic cost of a tax. The deadweight loss is an economic cost of monopoly. This is what economists worry about when we worry about monopoly. It's not that the monopolist is earning all these profits. That's fine. At least somebody is getting that money, okay? It's not that we necessarily want the consumer to get more surplus than the consumer is getting out of this. The big problem from an economic and social standpoint is there's this waste. There's all of these trades that could happen that would make both the, uh, the consumer and the producer, uh, well, at least they would make society better off in total. The problem is the producer would have to cut his price and that would reduce his share of the profits. And so he's not going to be willing to do that, okay? One last thing to say, uh, and then I'll close up this video. The Monopoly markup is bigger when you have a steeper demand curve, okay? Look at these two different graphs that I have here. Here is a market with a pretty elastic demand curve. Here's a, pro a market with a more inelastic demand curve. This might be an example like, um, I don't know, the demand curve for Coca-Cola or maybe the demand curve for um, a cruise vacation, okay? Demand is pretty elastic in that case. Now notice what that implies. You take, find the point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue and that sets the level of output, QM. Wherever that QM hits the it's the demand curve, that's gonna set the price. And notice that this is the size of your monopoly markup. Okay, so if the monopolist is selling something that is um, pretty elastic, consumers have lots of substitutes that they could go into instead, the monopoly markup is just not gonna be that big. 
okay? Because the, the firm's gonna lose a lot of sales by pushing up its uh, profit margins, okay? So there's not gonna be that much monopoly profit to be earned, and at least the height of the deadweight loss is gonna be you know, relatively uh, small. Over here, find that point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. That sets the price. Okay. And now the monopoly markup is going to be quite a bit bigger. Okay. Uh, this would be a market like... Um, Shoot, the name of the drug is uh, escaping me, but your textbook talks about it. It's a, an HIV AIDS, uh, AIDS antiretroviral uh, drug. And demand for that kind of a product is gonna be pretty steep, right? Pretty inelastic for two reasons. One, because you, um, uh, if you die, you can't purchase anything, right? Your, your consumption is zero if you die. So you, people are willing to spend quite a bit of money to save their own lives. And two, uh, pharmaceuticals are usually not paid for entirely by the, uh, the consumer. Usually a lot of the cost of the medication is covered by their insurance company. And I would be willing to spend a lot of my own money to save my own life but I'd be willing to spend almost all of your money or other people's money to save my own life. So as the price of this product goes up, I'm still gonna want to buy pretty much as much as I would have wanted to um, when the price was lower, okay? Now, under those circumstances, those types of firms can charge very large monopoly markups and earn significantly larger uh, economic profits for themselves. Notice, however, that that can also leave a much larger um, deadweight loss in comparison to the deadweight loss that is, uh, that's over here, okay? So the more elastic the demand curve, the smaller the monopoly markup, and the steeper, the more inelastic the demand curve, the bigger the monopoly markup. And that makes sense. The flatter your demand curve gets, the closer you are to being in a perfectly competitive market or the more similar your market is to a perfectly competitive market. In a perfectly competitive market, the demand curve is totally flat and you end up with no monopoly markup. In a firm that has a steep demand curve, you're going to get a substantial one. So that is it on uh, monopoly pricing and the monopoly markup. In the next video, we are going to talk about what would be the socially optimal price.